So I got the fuel rail up on the drill press. I'm using this or angle gauge to get it less than 0.1 degree or less than one degree. These are the ones I've drilled before sanding and chamfering the edges. That should be good for the 14 millimeter fuel injectors. All right, so I just got to the house to test fit the fuel rail. These are just some old injectors I had laying around, some decapped LS2 Bosch style injectors, but they are the same dimensions as the nice ones I got on the table over there. I just didn't want to run the risk of contaminating the injectors with metal shavings or any of that noise. So just wanted to do a test fit real quick. The injectors fit really nicely into the drilled holes on here. And if I blow or suck on this hole with my mouth, I don't get any leakage. Now that is not a uh, end all be all confirmed test, of course, but it's a pretty good indication. So I don't really know how I'm gonna go about testing it for being able to actually hold 60 PSI fuel pressure. I uh, probably just have to send it, honestly. It's probably just about as good as I can get it. So tonight I'm gonna go ahead and weld on a bong there and then uh, we'll be good. Uh, I Well, okay, we won't be perfectly good. I have to actually slightly shorten. If you look right here, there's these little black spacers and there's three of them. One, two, three. And I'm gonna have to shorten those a little bit because if you look at my injector, which I have them all turned down, but uh, if you look at my injector, I can pull it up into the bore, the drilled, the drilled hole in the uh, fuel rail, and you can see the ring starts to come out of the adapter, our, um, our fuel injector adapter down there. So there's just a little bit too much moving up and down. Uh, had I foreseen that, I would have drilled the holes just less deep in here, but I really had no good way of knowing that that was gonna be the case, unfortunately. Um, so all I'm going to do is probably just grind or lay, maybe stick, maybe chalk them up in the lathe and get precise with it, but just shorten this, uh, these little spacers and then we'll be good to go there. If I really screw them up or if I need a 3d print spacers, then I kind of plan to do that, uh, as need arised. Um, I need to kind of figure out these spacers and I'm going to hit this fuel rail with some paint. I think I might do black, which would kind of like break up all the gray. It would match my coil holders and my cover, of course. And but anyway, it's gonna get some paint for sure after I weld on the AN bung. All right, so I'm designing some new spacers on uh, Tinkercad this is for the 3D printer. I won't go into this whole process because there's a million 3D printing YouTube videos out there. But just a quick overview: the thickness of these is gonna be about 360 thou, or 0.36 inches. Um, so that's gonna take approximately about 120 thousandths of um, in play out of the injector so they don't move up and down in the bore quite as much. So I got those designed here. Then I have another app that you use to actually talk to the printer. I have an Ender 3. This is a really cheap 3D printer. Uh, I think I paid like 180 bucks on Amazon and it's mostly been good. It definitely, there's a lot of struggles with 3D printing. I'm not very good at it, but I'm really getting the hang of like the programming and like making the thing and telling it how like what settings to use to make it to make it turn out okay now the final product kind of hit or miss but more often than not it gets all the way through the print and it turns out being as good as i need it to be Got done welding our dash eight fitting onto the fuel rail and you know my usual blobby stuff but i think it'll be sealed up and good and uh, let's go see how our spacers did on the 3d printer all right looks like a successful print it's always kind of tricky getting these off of here ah. Ah. So the lighting in this room's terrible. Not bad. Let's see how it fits on uh, the engine. 
So you can see the obvious difference between these is uh, the, the height of them. Uh, of course, the original one, this is the, uh, the stock one, has this collar on both ends, and this one only has it on one end. Well, that's because in 3D printing, any overhang you have, like imagine this is upside, we're trying to print this like this, any of that overhang needs to be supported. Otherwise it'll just fall. Like you can't print on top of air. So when you have an, a ledge like that, you have to either tell the printer to add support, which it adds like really thin and kind of like, a, like ready, easy to break off um, plastic print that goes under that. Um, it does, this does affect the surface of the final product because on the bottom of this where the support was holding on, it'd be all ugly. Um, but in this case, we don't really need to have the collar on both sides because we'll use this one on the intake side on the bottom and it'll keep it in place while we get the rail in place. But once the bolts go through there, it's not going anywhere. It doesn't really need to be like centric. So that'll be just fine. Let's try it out. <laughs> So I should have about, I should have about a hundredth of uh, movement up and down. And that feels to be about right. So I can slide the injector. Oh, this one's kind of stuck. Well, it's not bound. So really like if you can twist them easily and they're not like super bound, that one's missing a seal. If you can miss, uh, rotate them pretty simply and they're not like bound up, then that means the hard parts of the injector aren't completely clamped. So that's what we want to avoid. We do have a little bit of a wiggy woggy up and down. So I think that is a winner. So our fuel rail is done, except for the paint. So it's a new night and I'm chipping away at things again. Right here, I got my uh, power distribution center that I'm working on and it still looks a little crazy right now, but just a series of eight relays, fuses. Um, this is pretty much gonna be everything that distributes power to the chassis and the mega squared and everything else that needs power. So I'm wiring that all up, documenting here, connector and views, uses. Uh, just kind of, I always like to document this stuff for looking back on at a later date. Uh, but also I got my fuel rail painted and this puppy turned out pretty sweet. That's a pretty good looking fuel rail. This ought to look pretty smart up there, so let's see what it'll look like. So the fuel rail is installed and it's looking real nice. I'm very happy with that. I actually went ahead and installed the 1500 CC injectors because at this point I don't see any reason to remove the rail moving forward. I mean, everything's done with the intake, uh, with the runners anyway. I mean, I still got to bolt this uh, reservoir onto, the, onto these, but I'm just gonna go ahead and wait on that, I think. But I'm gonna be pulling the whole intake as a whole off of the engine anyway for when I'm fabricating the engine mounts. So I got my fuse panel done. I'm not super proud of this thing. It's made with some super cheap stuff and I don't care for the way it looks. I was looking for just a plastic backing on this and like a plastic board of this sort that's kind of comparable in like thickness and strength. It was like 30 bucks. So I just 3D printed this thing and I can kind of see like the imperfections of the 3D printer texture. But anyway, it cost me like basically nothing to make. And the biggest I could do it is still too small. Like this is as large as I can make it. And that's why I had to do my relays in this goofy way where they're all coming off the corners of the mounting screws for the fuse box. But aside from that, I got a connector on either side that's gonna tie into the body of the car. And uh, you know, we got our all of our main relays and fuses right here. And as, even though this is just a cheap little crummy fuse box, it is kind of cool that, ah, it is kind of cool that uh, it's got these little lights that light up if a fuse blows. So 
I'm pretty sure we'll notice if we lose the fuel pump or engine module. But you know, if the radiator fan fuse blew, T fan, trans fan, and you might not notice that right away. Anyway, I'm not even sure where I'm gonna mount this thing. It's kind of big and cumbersome, but uh, basically all we gotta do is run power and ground to it. And, uh, and then the connector is basically just comprised of your signal circuits and your output circuits. So I've got that all here in my connector in view diagrams and what does what. So it'll get the job done. So we are gonna have to run a whole bunch of wiring in the car, obviously, um, but this will kind of be our main hub for power distribution. Thing I have on the list here that's kind of an irritating little issue that I gotta sort out is the super cheap header that I that I run uh, comes with this weird rectangle flange on it. The one on Ursula did too. I don't know what wastegate will fit that. Like I'm not even sure if there's anything out there that'll fit that. I've kind of searched a little bit, and I, well, any common wastegate's not going to fit this. Maybe there's some high end name brand one that it's meant for. I don't know. But anyway, what I do is I just weld the V band right onto the flange. I'm not going to bother cutting the flange off. I mean, the flange is welded on there and airtight. Presumably, you know, everything looks fine with that. I'm not gonna venture and do all that extra work. I'm just gonna weld this bastard right onto that flange, and then I can run a, a V-band style wastegate on the header. So I'll go TIG weld this up real quick, and that'll be one less thing on the list. <laughs> turned out pretty good. We got some nice color in those welds, which doesn't usually happen for me. I usually don't show my welds on video, but it went pretty good. So I'm all right with it this time. But real simple stuff here. I'm not even, I, I usually, I'd like to like cut the corners off this flange and just so it looks better. But honestly, this is gonna be way down low on the back of the engine. You're never gonna see it. And it's gonna have like a $50 eBay wastegate clamp to it. So I'm not too concerned about, uh, about uh, form here. But uh, that's gonna work just fine so we can hook our wastegate up and uh, have some control of our boost. Also, while I got things all torn down, this is the water outlet that goes right here. And it had this port on it that used to go to uh, like the throttle body or something like that. But we're not using it anymore, so I went ahead and welded it shut. Just kind of smashed it in the vise and then just, just ran my torch right over the edge there and it welded shut beautifully. So I got that done. So here's the current situation. I pulled the cams out of the engine uh, because I'm getting rid of the stock cams and installing some BC264 cams in these white boxes here. I'll show you those when the time comes. But we did get some 264 BC uh, Brian Crower uh, cams for this thing, which are kind of like a, a moderate, like street strip style power level. So they actually will work with the stock valve train. But speaking with uh, uh, Jeff, the machinist at, or the owner of Power Dynamics, uh, he's highly suggesting upgrading springs. He says even with a stock cam, upgrading the springs makes a huge difference on how these things act up top. So I went ahead and since I got the cams for free, I just had to pay shipping on those. And uh, they're used, but they're in great shape. Um, and so since I got those for a great deal, I went ahead and spent a little money on some BC uh, valve springs. Nothing crazy. They're just a good fit. For those over there and uh i really have to get this all done tonight that's the plan i i got started on it last night and figured out pretty quickly that i'm not going to be strong enough to push down the uh the upgraded springs it's not hard to push down on the stock springs using this tool that i whipped up real quick uh and so i was able to get the stock springs off just fine with that but the new ones are way too heavy so this is the part number we're using on springs. Where is it? Uh, BC0300S. This is uh, just a basic spring upgrade. It's just a single 
a single spring, nothing over the top, 80 pound seat pressure, but it's a really good mix for the uh, two, 264, I think. I think those are 264 cams. I'll clarify that in a minute once I unbox them. But uh, so once I figured out I couldn't compress the springs by hand, I started doing a little digging and I found this tool on Amazon. This is actually meant for a Subaru. And uh, the way it works, it's pretty simple. You just set it on the cylinder head. You find your two bolts to use the camshaft cap bolts to hold it in place. And then this little threaded thing screws down on top of this guy who sits up on the valve like that. And so it's pretty, pretty simple stuff. And you screw it down and it opens the valve. It's just the right size for the bore around the spring for the 2JZ spring. However, there is one thing that you got to deal with because it's for a Subaru and not exactly for a 2J. The holes, so it, did, it didn't have, so I like, I drilled this. I opened up the bottom here and drilled it in a ways to just allow for the uh, dowels to uh, fit in the tool. Otherwise it would have been like, like sitting up on top of it like that. And the stock uh, cap bolts would be too short. So I just took a drill bit. I don't really remember what size it was on the larger side, probably a little under half inch or something. Just drilled it in just a little ways, just make sure it's deeper than the height of these dowels. And so now when it sits, it's totally flush and the stock uh, uh, cam cap bolts will work on it. And uh, I've already like halfway done. Got my new springs and these steel retainers, single coil, 80 pound seat pressure springs. And I'm about halfway done. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish all these up and then we'll throw the camshafts on and double check our lash. So you'll see my orange ratchet strap here. Uh, what I'm doing to hold the valves up. So when typically if you're at a shop and you're a mechanic and you're doing this type of job, you're gonna use compressed air down in the spark plug hole and that compressed air will push the valves up and hold them up so that they won't fall down into the cylinder. But I don't have that capacity compressed air here. So I'm cramming the ratchet strap down into the spark plug hole just as much as I can fit in there with the piston slightly down. And then I'm turning the crankshaft to get the piston to come up and just squish up against the uh, ratchet strap. And that's been working pretty good for me. That's all I got for y'all this week, but we got a lot more work to do. Make sure y'all like and subscribe, and I'll see y'all next week.